these specialized drug units, which is what this unit was that authored this search warrant, are basically making all types of misrepresentations and the public, the media, and yes, other lawyers will just downright believe every single thing that they put in that search warrant. Hey YouTube, my name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney and welcome to my channel. I hope that you're all doing well. Uh, so today's video, I'm going to actually be keeping this kind of brief because I already did a three hour long live stream with Nate the Lawyer and Uncivil Law. I'll link it in the comment section down below concerning the Breonna Taylor case. I highly recommend that you guys check that out. But I wanted to do this quicker video where I reviewed the indictment with you guys and tell you why I reached the conclusion that I do that Breonna Taylor was actually murdered. So in this case, Breonna Taylor on March 13th of 2020 was at her home in Louisville, Kentucky in an apartment building um, and she resided on the second floor. So the officers uh, came to serve a search warrant on her home, made entry into her home. There is a dispute as to whether or not they knocked and they announced. They did have the authority for a no-knock warrant and Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, uh, Kenneth Walker, maintained that they did not knock and announce. There was also some testimony from a neighbor of Taylor's who stated that the police did not announce that they were police until after the gunshots had fired out. So apparently officers made entry into the apartment and then there is some dispute as to where Taylor was exactly, but it is maintained by all parties that Taylor was behind Walker. Walker, not knowing that these were law enforcement officers, fired one round, um, hitting one of the officers in the leg. Uh, Officer Brett Hankison exited from the apartment and began to shoot through the closed windows, allegedly with closed window blinds and um, a closed uh, glass door that had blinds in front of it that were also closed that he could not see into. He ended up shooting into the neighboring apartments as well. He was indicted for endangering Breonna Taylor's neighbors. However, he was found not guilty and acquitted um, just this year. So the issue that arose was that after the death of, sorry, while officers were shooting, and it wasn't Hankison, it was other officers were shooting, they fired off about 30 rounds and they struck Breonna Taylor in the chest, killing her. Breonna Taylor was a 26 year old EMT, originally from Michigan, who moved to Louisville, Kentucky in her teens. Officers um, had applied for a search warrant for Taylor's apartment because their target of the search warrant was a drug interdiction uh, based on her association with her ex-boyfriend, who at the time that the search warrant was served was currently incarcerated. So he was in jail. So to drive home just how ridiculous that information was, police not only wanted to get a search warrant to search the home of Breonna Taylor, they also wanted to physically search the person of Breonna Taylor, Adrian Walker, and her ex, Jamarcus Glover, who was already in jail. They asked for the permission to search someone when they already had that person in custody. But they were serving the search warrant, searching for drugs in connection to him. There were allegations that were placed in the search warrant, and three of those allegations are the most important to the federal indictment that came down in August of 2022. So this shooting occurred in 2020. Massive protests erupted as a result of it. People were very upset that only Brett Hankison was uh, indicted and he was only indicted for endangering Breonna Taylor's neighbors, but no one that shot Breonna Taylor was actually indicted and no one involved in the search warrant application or service was actually indicted. So people were very upset about that. And remember, it was an authorized no knock search warrant. So even though officers maintained that they knocked, other people in the apartment maintained that they did not hear the officers knock and they did not hear them announce. There was a battering ram that was used to break in the door. And I could tell you that as a criminal defense attorney, when officers use a battering ram to break into a door, it is very unlikely that they knocked and announced. So I just want that to be very, very clear. You're gonna have a lot of attorneys who are gonna have opinions on things based on what the law enforcement officers say, but I would say to take that with a grain of salt because the practice of using the battering ram is either you knocked and announced and you've been waiting there for a long time and no one answered, 
or you're just barging in without knocking and announcing. They don't need to use the battering ram if they knock and announce. Most people, when you say police come to the door, the door is opened up. And there's no allegation that Walker or Breonna Taylor failed to answer the door after the police knocked and announced and said that they were coming in. They didn't say that they knocked and they announced and they waited and nobody came in and so they they used the battering ram. They just said they knocked and announced and then just immediately started using the battering ram. That is not common law enforcement practice. That is not normal at all. The law enforcement officers that did enter her home did so with the authority of a search warrant that was authored by Officer Joshua James and signed off on by an officer named Kyle Meany. Joshua James and Kyle Meany placed several allegations in the search warrant application that tied Brianna Taylor to her ex-boyfriend who was incarcerated. There are three allegations that are the most important when looking at the issue of these officers being indicted federally by the Justice Department for the death of Brianna Taylor. So when you look through the allegations, they state, and remember, these are alleged. These pers- people are alleged to have committed these offenses. These officers, they are presumed innocent and they will have their day in court. But Joshua James and Kyle Meany are alleged to have applied for the search warrant under the penalty of perjury. Whenever you sign a search warrant, you can fill out an affidavit under the penalty of perjury. And in that search warrant, they made three allegations that were allegedly false. They made more allegations, but three of them are alleged to be false, knowing that these, this, that these allegations would lead to the issuance of the search warrant And then knowing that that could in turn lead to a dangerous situation because search warrant services on homes can in fact be dangerous. You can't see what's happening inside the home. The homeowner doesn't know who's coming into their home unless the officer knocks and announces. So it can lead to a dangerous situation, which it clearly did here. And those three allegations were that Breonna Taylor's ex-boyfriend was receiving packages to her home that he lived in her residence and that the post office confirmed that Breonna Taylor's ex-boyfriend was receiving packages to her home. Now, the other thing is that they they allegedly did some type of operation in which they watched the ex-boyfriend some time before this search warrant was applied for in March of 2020. However, it was many, many months before the search warrant was applied for in March of 2020. Sometime around, I believe, December of 2019. I'll I'll correct it um, on the screen caption here if I'm wrong about the time. But there was some time where they observed uh, the ex-boyfriend pick up a package at Breonna Taylor's house and bring it to what they called a trap house or a drug house. However, that was far before the search warrant was served and that's something called stale. So the officers relying on stale information, they needed more to bolster up the fact that they they needed something to bolster and show that Taylor had had recent contact with her ex-boyfriend. Let's be very, very clear. She now has a new boyfriend. He's staying over at her house. The old boyfriend is incarcerated. So it's clear that some time has passed between when the officers say that they observed Um, the ex-boyfriend enter her home, receive a package, and then go to what they call a trap house, right? So there is some time that elapsed. And so if all they relied on was that, there is a question as to whether or not there would be probable cause for the search warrant because that evidence was what's called stale. And Meany and Jane's in the search warrant application Um, made these false allegations according to the Justice Department in order to bolster up information which they knew were stale. So the way that this conspiracy to put these lies into the search warrant were discovered and the evidence that before they wrote the search warrant, they had knowledge that the affidavit contained false, deliberately false information. The Justice Department points to several overt acts. And one of those is that Officer Joshua James uh, met up with an officer called JM and tried to get JM to say that JM had previously told James that Brianna Taylor was in fact receiving packages at her apartment for her ex-boyfriend who is identified as JG in the indictment. In fact, counter to that, JM had told Joshua James in January of 2020, which was three 
months or two and a half months before the search warrant affidavit was sworn out. He had told Joshua Jane that he had no information that Breonna Taylor was receiving packages for her ex-boyfriend at her apartment. In addition, the other allegation is that James and Meany stated in the search warrant affidavit that they had conducted a joint operation with the post office and the post office had confirmed that Brianna Taylor was receiving packages for her ex JG at her apartment at the time that the search warrant affidavit was sworn. In fact, representatives of the postal inspector stated that no such joint operation occurred and they had never told Joshua James or Meany that Breonna Taylor was receiving packages from her ex-boyfriend, um, JG, as he's identified in the indictment. In addition to these three misrepresentations, after Breonna Taylor was killed in the shootout at her apartment, based on that search warrant that they swore out with false information, the officers proceeded to allegedly lie to internal investigators within the Louisville, Kentucky Police Department and investigators within the FBI. And it's also a separate crime to lie to the FBI. So Meany and Janes have both been indicted for lying to the FBI, conspiracy, as well as deprivation of rights of Breonna Taylor. And the reason that they're charged with these things is because the Justice Department alleges that Breonna Taylor has the right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures. And in swearing out a warrant affidavit for Taylor's home, they deprived her of that right where they knew that the information was false and could have led to a search warrant being served on her home and therefore could have led to a dangerous situation, which is obviously what resulted in this particular case. The, co the cover up that was alleged when they lied to the FBI included meeting up with another member of law enforcement known as KG in Joshua James's garage on May 17th of 2020 in order to coordinate their stories that they would tell to the FBI. During this meeting, allegedly, Officer Joshua James, who swore out the affidavit under the penalties of perjury, that there were these connections between Breonna Taylor and her ex-boyfriend that was in jail at the time, uh, Joshua James spoke to KG and said to him, him that they needed to coordinate their stories and get their stories straight or else they were going to be in trouble. In addition, they tried to get other officers to lie and say, as I told you before, that that officer had told James that Breonna Taylor was receiving packages at her apartment for her ex-boyfriend. Joshua James also wrote something called an investigative letter in response to the ongoing investigation from the death of Breonna Taylor and, and introduced that investigative letter to the internal affairs of the, affairs of the Louisville, Kentucky Police Department and to the FBI, constituting the additional line to the FBI charge. Finally, Brett Hankison was also indicted, and that was the officer that exited Breonna Taylor's home and shot up the you know area outside of Breonna Taylor's home, shooting into the apartment, putting other officers and civilians in danger. So he was uh, charged with deprivation of rights for shooting disproportionately and dangerously into the neighborhood and apartment where Breonna Taylor was living. Was was living at the time of the police raid. So that officer that Joshua James allegedly met up with is identified as in his garage in order to coordinate lying to the FBI and other members of law enforcement um, was identified as KG in Joshua James's indictment. However, that person's name is Kelly Goodlett and they actually have their own indictment. And Kelly Goodlett is charged with one count of conspiracy, conspiring to knowingly falsify a warrant affidavit and to knowingly engaging in misleading conduct towards another person with the intent to hinder, delay, and prevent the communication of, of information to a federal law enforcement officer. So basically lying to the FBI and conspiracy to falsify the um, application for the affidavit uh, of the search warrant. Now, there has been a lot of uproar since these indictments have come down. First and foremost, I want to address the fact that, uh, and some this is something that Nate the lawyer pointed out, 
Uh, none of the officers that would have shot Breonna Taylor, she was only shot once, but the officers that were inside the apartment that shot Breonna Taylor, none of those officers were indicted. And I believe that the reason being is that the FBI is proceeding under the theory that the officers that were there on the scene had nothing to do with the search warrant affidavit actually being sworn out. So they participated in the raid, but they were just carrying out the orders of the search warrant to carry out this no-knock warrant. However, the reason that Hankerson, who was on scene, was actually indicted, I believe, is because he used excessive force. So even if officers have the right to use force in the execution of their duty, so they, they're saying basically those other officers had the right to return fire because they were legally present in the apartment at the time that the search warrant was served, or at least they had good faith to believe that they should be in the apartment at the time that the search warrant was served but that the other officer practiced excessive force by exiting the apartment and shooting outside of the apartment. And what that goes back to is that officers have the right to use force, but the force cannot be excessive. And the case that lays out those factors for what is and is not excessive force is the United States Supreme Court case by the name of Graham v. Connor, which established several factors for what constitutes excessive force. The overriding theme of which is whether or not the officer's behavior was objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them. So they look at the facts and circumstances on the ground at the time and whether or not an officer's behavior was objectively reasonable. Here, the Justice Department is saying that Hankison's behavior is not objectively reasonable because it was unreasonable to exit from the apartment and start shooting from the outside where you can't see what's happening on the inside. The inverse of that logic is that the Justice Department believes that the other officers on scene who shot were objectively reasonable because as they understood it, they were executing a lawful search warrant and they had uh, the ability to return fire when fired upon. The ultimate irony of this is that Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, Mr. Walker, also had the right to use deadly force and was reasonable in his behavior as well. Um, in fact, the charges against him for shooting one of the officers ended up being dismissed. So in this particular case, the allegations basically break down to this. Officers applied for a search warrant in order to enter Breonna Taylor's home under the theory that her boyfriend was still having uh, drug packages delivered to her home, that her boyfriend was still residing within her residence, and that the post office or the postal inspector had verified this. And all of these things are alleged to have been false. And therefore, when officers went to enter into Taylor's home on this no-knock warrant, and again, I realize law enforcement is saying that they knocked, but once again, I don't believe them. That's my own personal belief. I do not believe them. And I don't think that that's an established fact based on the fact that Walker and the neighbor said that that's not what happened, that they did not hear them knock and announce. But either way, when the officers entered into Breonna Taylor's apartment, even though the particular officers that were entering her apartment may not have known or did not know about the lies in the search warrant, the effect was that harm was caused to individuals because of these lies, and the officers knew that these lies would cause this harm, and they knew that they were lies at the time that they they at the time that they swore out the affidavit for the search warrant. There are usually limited consequences for an officer swearing out a false search warrant. There is a case called Franks v. Delaware, which is a 1978 Supreme Court case in which the court found that if the defendant can establish that material misrepresentations were made in the affidavit of the search warrant, meaning not only did the officer lie, but the lies had to go to the heart of the search warrant. It had to be a material misrepresentation of fact that is alleged by the defendant, meaning they lied about something like the nexus, tying the drugs or the uh, contraband such as a gun to the home that they intend to search. If they lied about something material like that, then that would warrant what's called a Frank's hearing, which would be a further hearing to determine whether or not this officer actually made, actually lied in the affidavit for the search warrant. 
The outcome is that if the defendant is successful at their Franks hearing, and remember, they have to first reach the threshold of showing that their allegation goes to a material misrepresentation of fact. So they can't just get a hearing outright. They have to actually show that it's a material misrepresentation. But once you get the Franks hearing, if you're successful, the only thing you get out of that is the suppression of the evidence which in the context of a criminal defense attorney is great. That's great if I can get evidence suppressed because an officer violated my client's constitutional rights by lying about material misrepresentations in the affidavit for the search warrant. However, if for example, officers lie about the material information in the search warrant and they serve a search warrant on someone's home, damages the home, assault someone, causes death, causes destruction to property, Nothing will happen to the officers most of the time if no contraband is found in the home. Like here, what happened with Breonna Taylor. It's taken two years for the Justice Department to indict, and people have different theories as to why it's taken two years, but namely it's because the state of Kentucky, under the leadership of Attorney General Daniel Cameron, have refused to really look into this case and to hold the officers accountable for their obvious lies in the application for the search warrant. Again, we're just talking about my opinion at this point in time. So I think what this is showing is that it took years of protests hashtags and pressure for the federal government to step in and the state government has never done anything to really hold the officers who lied in the search warrant affidavit allegedly accountable. And that's because normally there are no consequences to officers personally or professionally who lie in affidavits for search warrants. It is very rare for an officer to be indicted for lying in an affidavit to a search warrant, although it is perjury to do so. Affidavits are signed under the penalty of perjury and the failure to tell the truth about material issues is supposed to be disfavored according to the case law, but rarely does anything ever happen. This leads to a ripple effect of officers using search warrants with stale or false or misleading information that lack in probable cause in order to enter people's homes for the purposes of drug interdiction. The drug war has been used in our country consistently as a tool of seizing the assets of people. Many times if no drugs are found, officers will still do things like take cars, take money, take all types of things and hold them as evidence. I've had clients whose mother's cell phones were taken away. The grandmother's laptop is taken away. These people have nothing to do with any potential crime, yet all their things are taken away. And even when the person is victorious in their criminal case, they still have to fight to get back their property. So there is also the issue that these drug units, these specialized drug units, which is what this unit was that authored this search warrant, are basically making all types of misrepresentations and the public, the media, and yes, other lawyers will just downright believe every single thing that they put in that search warrant. They could say, you know, um, complaining witness or C, uh, CI, confidential informant number one, told us that John Smith was dealing drugs without identifying who the person is in the application for the search warrant, nothing to back up what they're alleging, no pictures of any drug buys or anything like that. And that could literally be a lie. In fact, I've seen cases in which it is, but people will take those allegations and say, oh, well, they got a search warrant and just believe it just because the officer said it. The same thing goes to the allegation that they did knock and announce after being given a no-knock warrant. Even though all the civilians are saying that they did not knock and announce, the police officer's contention, even after they've been indicted for lying, that they knocked and announced is being generally accepted by the public and other lawyers. So just like with the Debt v. Heard case, the Alex Jones case, and this case, I am going to encourage you to use your own good sense and critical thinking skills and reach your own conclusions. Whenever you read a newspaper article that is told explicitly from the perspective of law enforcement and law enforcement only, and only their allegation of events, 
you should always look at it skeptically. I'm not saying that the media should not report what law enforcement says. I'm saying that just because the law enforcement says it doesn't mean that you should just accept that it is true. These alleged lies had to be so overblown and easily provable for these officers to be indicted and the case had to receive national attention, but there are Breonna Taylors every single day. And to a lesser extent, people that don't die, but end up either injured with their property stolen every single day. And if there's no criminal charges, there's no real recourse for them. Think about it. You know, who, who are they going to hire to represent them in a lawsuit against the police for breaking their iPad or for taking the ring camera off of their door so that the police cannot be filmed as they're entering into someone's home or entering in someone's home before they get a warrant, standing in the person's house and then getting a warrant afterwards. But they've already been all up inside the person's house in violation of their Fourth Amendment. All of these are things examples of cases that I have dealt with and my colleagues have dealt with. And I've been in the law for over a decade at this point. So I think that, you know, we'll see more fallout from the Breonna Taylor case. But the number one thing that I want us to all learn from this is that just because the officer says it does not mean it's true. I think the worst thing that they did on, uh, aside from murdering Breonna Taylor, was assassinating her character in order to cover for their lies. They had every single intent to cover up that they lied in the search warrant affidavit by trying to make Breonna Taylor out to be some gangbanger, thug, drug dealer. When this woman was an EMT who might have had a questionable choice in an ex-boyfriend, but was certainly living a very clean life and had no criminal record whatsoever. That was evidenced by the fact that they found no drugs and no money in her apartment. So please, I implore you, I beg you, practice critical thinking skills the next time you read an article about an officer involved shooting or some type of law enforcement operation. They get their story straight. That doesn't mean that you have to buy it right away.